Jesus. Amen. John chapter 14, beginning at verse number 23, reading through verse 28, I have an extremely powerful, important message today that I believe will possibly clear up a lot of confusion for a lot of people. Hopefully it will offer an explanation to many things that, especially those who are not part of the one God, Jesus name, apostolic theological position, maybe this will help you better to understand. John chapter 14, verses 23 through 28. I've got it on the screen overhead. For those in the building today, and the word of the Lord reads from the King James text. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. I'm going to talk to us today for a while. I hope I can keep it in a timely uh, order, but I'm going to talk to us for a while on the topic, the design of the sun, S-O-N, the design of the sun. By your heads with me a moment, Master, once again, God, we come before you. The moment has come in this service when the word of God must be broken, the bread of life must be disseminated to the people of God. We need the divine sustenance, the understanding, the revelation that comes from this wonderful sacred text, this divine gift that is given to the church so that those with hungry hearts and sincere minds might understand the divine. Master, open our hearts, our minds, our spirits today. Not only that we might hear the words which are spoken in this place, but that we might hear from the Holy Ghost, your spirit, Lord, that it might be able to open up revelation and understanding within us that we have never before had. Master, in the name of Jesus, pour out the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon this poor preacher that I might do your word justice, that I might present it in a manner that is pleasing in your sight and in a manner, O oh God, that brings about change and challenges in our hearts and lives. I ask it today, O oh God, in none other than Jesus' precious, sacred name. Amen. Praise God and amen. 
if there is any truth in the Word of God that is tantamount, if there is any truth in the Word of God that supersedes all other truth, it is a truth that the Jewish people repeat many times a day every time they go to prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Through, throughout the Old Testament, God speaks from his throne over and 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 over again and declares through the prophets and the writers of the Old Testament text, I am God, I am alone up here, beside me there is no God, Beside me there is no Savior. Beside me there is no other. If there's any doctrine that hinders Jewish people from coming into the Christian faith, it is primarily the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity contradicts everything that Jewish men and women, boys and girls are taught concerning God from their earliest days. I knew a Jewish man in New York City. He and I were very friendly. He was part of a discussion group that I used to attend in the city at the local community center. And one day, this young man and I, I say young man, he was probably my age or a little bit older, but he and I began to talk, and I was explaining to him, I said, honestly, his name was Charlie, as a matter of fact. I said, honestly, Charlie, many, especially in the Jewish community, do not understand that not all of Christianity is comprised of people who embrace and preach the doctrine of the Trinity. And he said, really? Because my understanding was that all Christians embrace this doctrine. I said, well, you know, let me tell you how Catholicism works. And let me tell you how fundamentalist Christianity, a lot like mommy, works. If you don't believe everything exactly the way they teach it, you are apostate, you are heretical, you are completely out of whack and there is no hope for you, there is no salvation for you. Fundamentalism rejects the oneness doctrine. It rejects the apostolic doctrine of the oneness of God because we don't embrace the definition of God that God exists as three persons. Namely, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that somehow these three separate entities comprise one singular God. The doctrine is convoluted. It is confusing. I grew up in it, and I still can tell you, most people I know who will be honest will tell you that they... They either simply accept that there are three gods because you can't have three divine beings and claim they all comprise one singular God and yet you only refer to the one divine being who is the Father as God. The only 
being in the Word of God who is described as both God and the Father is the Father. Nowhere in the Word of God do you read the language of the Trinity, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. That is, no, that is language that was developed through tradition over the course of the centuries. It is not biblical language. It is not used in Scripture. But there are passages in the Word of God which can confuse and confound even those who today believe the oneness doctrine. Some people don't understand how it is that Jesus the Christ could be both man and be God at the same time. How he could be both, listen to me, both the Father and the Son. How is it possible that he should be or could be? And yet in the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah 9 and 6, Isaiah declares, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the, the, the mighty God, the, the, not a, the everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Everybody understands that Jesus is called wonderful. Everybody understands that Jesus is called counselor. Everybody understands that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. But somehow, certain people choke when it comes time to declare that Jesus is the everlasting Father, hallelujah. That Jesus is the mighty God, hallelujah. Yet the same passage that calls him wonderful counselor, prince of peace, also calls him the mighty God and the everlasting Father. One of the most difficult theological concepts for most believers to wrap their minds around is the divinity of Christ. How on earth can Jesus Christ the man be in fact divine? How can he possibly be the physical manifestation of God himself? Surely he is a different person from the Father. Surely he is a creation of God and not a manifestation of God himself. But understanding the design of the Son is not as difficult as one might think when it is addressed biblically with purpose. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and for the sake of time, I include also verses 10 and 11, John, the only disciple described in the Word of God as the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, the only disciple whose account of the gospel is almost entirely focused on the divinity of Christ. John understood who Jesus was before Peter. He understood who Jesus was before any of the other disciples. He, whoo, glory, he could see through the veil of flesh and blood, and he could understand that within this man beat the heart of the divine. Hallelujah. Within this man existed the very spirit and essence and power and glory of Almighty God. And John writes in the beginning of his gospel, 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, singular. And without Him, listen to me, was not anything made that was made. Oh my God, honey, He cannot be Michael the Archangel because He made Michael the Archangel. Hallelujah! There was not anything made that was made except that was made by Him. Oh, hallelujah! He made all things. How hard is that to get? Verses 10 and 11, John 1. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. Not by them. By him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. How can Jesus be God? It's impossible. In your primary text today, the very last statement the Lord made in John 14 and verse 28 is, I... Uh, you should rejoice because I said I go unto the Father for my Father is greater than I. So obviously, He's not the Father. The Father's greater than He. They must be different. They must be someone different. No. They must be something different. Meaning, there must be something different between the Father and the Son. Well, of course, there's something different. Number one, God is a spirit, Jesus said, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So right there, you know, something's different because God is spirit. Jesus was a man. He was a human being standing in front of you. The term greater, melison in the Greek, is an adjective which simply means larger or stronger. He's saying the Father, the Spirit, as Spirit, God is much bigger than this little man. As Spirit, the Father is much greater than this little man on planet Earth. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the Son was designed in such a way so as not to be the Father. <laughs> Say, well, preacher, you're not making any sense. Sure, I'm making sense. Jesus came. God manifested himself in human form so that he might be called and be known as the Son of God. He cannot set an example for the people of God and show them how to live as sons and daughters if he comes as the father. If your father wants to teach you how to be a good son and how to do things right, there is no way on earth your father can teach you how to be a good son through being a father. Say, well, sure he can teach me. No, he can teach you what he'd like you to do and how he'd like you to behave and how he'd like you to act. But he cannot demonstrate for you as a son 
how a son should behave, how a son should act. No, because he's your father. That relationship changes everything. So in order for God to be able to come to earth and demonstrate for us what a son or a daughter should look like, he had to design the son, listen to me carefully, to be a son. To behave like a son. To relate to God like a son. Oh, are you hearing me today, children? We could not learn from him what we learn from him except that he convincingly play the role of a son. Oh, my goodness. Philippians 2. Five through eight, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Listen, who being in the form of God, that would be blasphemy right there. Any Jew reading this would immediately say, this is blasphemy. To say that Jesus Christ ever existed in form as God is blasphemy, okay? Listen, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Well, wait a minute. Satan was cast out of heaven for desiring to be equal with God. I shall be as God. Is that not equality? Is he not trying to ascribe to himself uh, the same, the similar as God? Yes. And Satan fell out of heaven for that aspiration. But he said, being in the form of God, so as God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. When did he not think it was robbery? Well, we'll find out in a second. When he was designing the son. Because listen. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon himself took upon him the form of a servant. Oh, wait a minute. So you mean God didn't sit there and make Jesus humbled? Didn't make him into the image of a servant? Didn't make him in the form of a servant? Didn't make him humble? No, 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 no. Did all that himself. Well, why did he do it himself? Because he was God, honey. There was no other person designing this being who was to walk earth as the Son of God. God himself did it. And as he did it, he said, I could go to earth and be God. And there'd be nothing wrong with that because I am God. Only problem is, I've got this balance that I have to strike. There has to be enough of my divinity to kind of peek out through the cracks so as to allow those who seek Messiah to accept me as Messiah. But I can't allow enough divinity to shine through so that those in power and authority recognize who I really am. Boy, I'm telling you, talk about a pickle. Talk about a dilemma. Talk about a situation. So God has this balance he has to strike. I've got to let enough power and glory shine through so that the prophecies concerning me in the Old Testament will clearly identify me as Messiah. 
but I can't let too much because then people who will have the power to do so might recognize who I am and the word of God tells us that if they did recognize who he was they wouldn't have crucified him he said for me to do what I'm there to do I've got to be less than the father so what will I do? How will I design myself? How will I cause myself to be manifest? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to humble myself. And I'm going to appear in the form of a servant. I, I'm not going to go as a king, which I am, but rather I'm going to go as a servant. Kind of reminds me of the old play or the old movie or the old story, The Prince and the Pauper. And how the pauper and the prince looked so much alike that they were able to switch roles. And the prince was able to walk about as a poor boy. And no one recognized him for who he truly was. Did it change the fact he was the prince? Not at all. Not in the least. Does it change the fact that Jesus is the father? As he walks upon the earth, the only man ever born with no human father, knowing only the parentage of God Almighty alone. Thus he is called the Son of God. Thus he is called not only the Son of God, the only begotten gotten son of God meaning the only son of God ever born of God was he born in heaven no was he a son in heaven no he was the father in heaven but he was born on earth the son which is why again the Old Testament prophet says unto us a child is born. Oh, hallelujah. Unto us, a son is given. Hallelujah. He is only a son after the flesh. So therefore, there is distinction between his manifestation in the flesh and his manifestation in spirit. When he speaks of going to the Father, he's not talking about going to see another person. He's talking about returning to what? The place of the Spirit, where the Spirit dwells, where the Spirit of the Almighty abides. The heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool, God declares. How are you going to get all that? In a little, little, little man. You can't. Now you can put enough of that in a man. So that that man contains everything that is in God. So that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in him bodily. Oh my Lord have mercy. But you cannot quantitatively. Get all of God in one man, which is why Jesus said, my father is greater than I. You're comparing the ocean to a bay. You're comparing the ocean to an inlet. They're all seawater, honey. The water that's in the bay is in the ocean. The water that's in the ocean is in the bay. But when you look at the bay, it has parameters. It has a boundary. Now there is... A little section that connects it to the greater sea. Am I telling the truth? But when you look at the bay of water, you can easily see that it's confined. When you look at Jesus the man, you're looking at God, but you can easily see that he is confined to an area, to a space. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. In the likeness of men. 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And the next word is, but. But. Herein lies the key to this passage. As God, the, lost, the Lord saw no problem with the Messiah, the man Jesus Christ, being identical to God himself. But, but, the word but indicates that there is a however. Although God saw no issue with the Son being equal to the Father, listen to me, in design and function, he still did something differently. But, however, he still did something differently. Instead of Messiah walking the earth as God, it was necessary that he be able to experience certain human limitations and certain human realities. In order for God to be able to do this, he had to design the Son in such a manner as to allow him as a man to do so. So, he humbled himself or he reduced himself. He made himself smaller. Oh my goodness. My father is greater than I. For me to appear to you as God manifests in human form, I could have come and stood in front of you as God, but, 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 however, I humbled myself. I took upon myself the form of a servant. I reduced myself. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. The word humble in the Greek that is used, tapino, it's a verb meaning to make low or to bring low, to level or to reduce a plane, to lower or to depress. It was imperative that a man born of God or born to God a, a human being born of God be lower in rank and nature than the Father. Firstly, it would be impossible for a man to quantitatively contain the whole of God's Spirit. A human body wouldn't even be able to contain the whole of God's spirit. If you even tried it, I'm pretty sure the body would explode. In Isaiah 66 and verse 1, the Lord God declares, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? In John chapter 1 and verse 18, the word of the Lord declares, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, listen, which is in, present tense, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Bosom. Kolpos in the Greek literally means it can refer to the front of the body between the arms, the bosom, like you hold someone in your bosom. But it also is defined, listen to me, as a bay of the sea. <laughs> While a bay is a much smaller area, containing the sea's water, it is yet part of the sea. 
all the ocean contains is chemically present in the bay as well. It is smaller in quantity and in appearance, but it, it is still the sea. My Lord, have mercy. In Colossians 2, 8 and 9, Paul writes to the church, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and, and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Godhead, theotes, noun, meaning, the state of being God or deity. In him dwelleth all the fullness of divinity bodily. That is what that means. Trinitarians try to read into this something different, but they're not using the actual literal definition of the term from the Hebrew, excuse me, from the Greek. If God were going to be able to perform his mission as the Christ, the Messiah, the promised Redeemer of Israel, it was imperative that he somehow, some way, designed the man Jesus in such a way as to create the role of son. And he must be able to perform as a son. He must be able to act as a son. He must be able to behave as a son. And, listen, he must be capable of choice. He must be capable of emotion. He must be capable of weakness. He must be able to experience pain. And he must be able to genuinely experience death. So, a partition was necessary between the flesh and the divine so that the divinity within did not interfere with the mission and purpose of his coming in the flesh. So God designed the Son, as it were, with a partition that separated in part the divine from the human, the flesh. He had to do this because if there were no partition, Jesus couldn't have died. If there were no partition, Jesus couldn't experience pain. If there were no partition, Jesus could not have joys. If there were no partition, Jesus could not have experienced the experience of human beings. And we would have a high priest who was not able to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But we do have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Why? Because God divided designed the son with a partition there were boundaries he created he had this balance he had to strike say well preacher why did you start out talking about John in the first chapter of John in the beginning was the word and the word was with God because people are so foolish even theologians are about as dumb as rocks they act like God is so small and so limited. Well, all he had to work with, all God had to work with, was, you had the Father and all he had to work with was with the Son, the other person of the Trinity, and the Holy Ghost. That's all they had to work with. So he had to send the Son. It, it's as if all this stuff was ready-made and all this stuff was there. 
and God just had to work with what he had. That is the theological position of Trinitarian theology. The only problem is in John chapter 1, John makes it clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here's where the problem comes. I grew up in a Trinitarian church. I was always taught that the Word, you know, that just means, you know, it, it's like the Bible, that the Bible existed, and Jesus was the living Word. He was the living Word. That's all well and good. The only problem is that is not what the term Word means in the Greek. See, theologians love to apply their own definitions to things. No, in the Greek, the term word literally means, listen to me, listen to me, a thought or a plan or an idea, listen, verbally expressed. So in the beginning, God said something. In the beginning, oh my Lord, God had a plan. He had an idea. He had a thought that he expressed. I imagine it went something like this. I will create a world populated by people who will not share my nature because they will choose to disobey me. And I will go to them personally and redeem them and save them so that I might have a bride. I might have a companion throughout all of eternity. Listen to me. Who has chosen me and who loves me because they chose to do so, not because they were designed to do so. And the Word was with God. So from the very start of creation, God spoke this plan. From the very start of creation, this plan was with God. It was in God's mind. It was in His heart. And the Word was God, God himself was part of the plan. God himself was in the plan. And he said so. Hallelujah. Oh, my word, have mercy. So a partition was needed. He had to be able to experience various aspects of human existence. And it was imperative that his divinity not interfere with his fleshly mission and purpose in coming. This partition would not at all change the reality of the man Jesus Christ having no earthly father. The partition, this partition, would not change the fact that within him, the Spirit of God directed and guided him at all times and at every turn. In John chapter 8, verses 25 through 29, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. 
And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I always do. I do always those things that please him. In John chapter 14, verse Verses 6 through 11, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, Ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, listen, and have seen him. Blasphemy. Complete and utter blasphemy. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believe thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Remember what I said about a bay versus the sea? Everything in the sea is in the bay. Everything in the bay is in the sea. Oh, my Lord, hammer, that's what Jesus is saying. Don't you get, you're, you're looking at the bay, honey. But when you look at the bay, you're seeing the sea. When you look at the sea, you're seeing the bay. We're the same exact thing. There is no difference. There is only delineation. It's all about manifestation. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you. I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. See how he's trying to explain that the Father, the Spirit, is literally driving this little man. He's inside working the controls. Hallelujah. He's trying to tell him there is a line of partition because there has to be a certain amount of reservation. There has to be a certain amount held back. There has to be a certain amount that is reduced or else I wouldn't be able to die. I wouldn't be able to do what I've come to do. But honey, the father's in here driving this car. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Or what, Jesus, you're not beside the Father? No, Lord, you're not in the Father, you're beside the Father. Wait a minute, Lord, what do you mean you're in the Father? You're standing here in front of me as a man. How can you be in the Father when you're standing right here in front of me? And how can the Father be in you, do you see? You see that relationship? Do you see the bay of water versus the sea? That's all Jesus is saying. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In order for God to walk as man, to live as the physical offspring of himself, it was essential that he walk with certain limitations. The Spirit of God designed the man Jesus to be subject to a partition which caused the physical man to be constrained from knowing certain things. While the Spirit within him had certain knowledge, that knowledge was withheld from the physical flesh and blood mind of the man Jesus Christ. 
Remember I talked about that partition? That's part of what that partition did. God said, as I'm walking the earth, that manifestation of me cannot know everything that I know. There's certain things I'm going to have to hold. See, that's how that partition worked. He partitioned off certain things. He was to demonstrate as our example. He was to demonstrate for us how to be the sons and daughters of God. He could not do this if he appeared to us simply as the father. As the father, he could only teach, lecture us on sonship. But as one of us, he could literally perform as a son. And thus demonstrate and be an example for us. In Matthew 24 verse 36 Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In Mark 13, 32, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, listen to the language, knoweth no man, knoweth no man. He was manifested as a man and being found in fashion as a man. So there were things that had to be withheld from him as a man if he was going to truly be a man. So God had this tremendous balance he had to strike. But nobody can design like God. Hallelujah. Nobody can build like God. This is why Jesus said, I can't tell you when I'll return. Because in the flesh, that partition that I designed for myself does not permit me in the flesh to know this. Oh my goodness. I got the Holy Ghost, but I'll tell you what, the Holy Ghost dwells in me. According to the Word of God, the Holy Ghost dwells in believers. That doesn't mean believers know everything God knows. We don't know what day and hour the Lord's going to come. No, why? Because there's a partition. What? You mean to tell me that that partition works in us too? Sure it does. Sure it does. Creates boundaries, creates limits so that the Spirit can dwell within us but that there are certain constraints. That's how God designed the Son. Hallelujah. That's how He designed the man Jesus. When the Father assumed the role of the Son, he immersed himself in that role. It was imperative that he do so, so as, uh, as not to break character. Were he to break character, he would have irrefutably revealed his true identity. And that revelation would have interfered with his mission. In John chapter 12 verse 27 the Lord said, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. So I came with a mission. I came with a purpose. I came with a plan. If his divinity were on full display, then that plan would have been prevented from being realized. So he had to sell the role of the son so as not to appear the father. But at the same time, he was still very much the father. Oh my goodness, listen. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, or those that are mature or complete. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, 
even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Listen to verse 8, 1 Corinthians 2, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see why the design of the Son was so important? Uh, if the right people know who I am, it will frustrate my entire plan. So the Son has to appear the Son. Those who follow me, those who believe in me, I will grant to them the revelation so they'll know who I really am. But I'm not going to let everybody know. Oh, my goodness. Jesus said to his disciples, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. The divine drama that was to be played out before humanity required that God appear as a man. God is not a man. So for him to appear as a man and perform as a man, that man must have some limitations imposed by God himself. God himself performed two roles. You remember the Old Testament prophet described a vision of the wheel in the middle of a wheel. Hallelujah. One wheel rotated in one direction and the other wheel rotated in the other direction. <laughs> this is a foretelling. Hallelujah. How can he be the Father and the Son? How can he be a wheel turning one way and a wheel turning the other way? Hallelujah. Glory to God. How is it possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. It's easy as pie. He's God. He doesn't have to be two people, you ding dong. He's God. He can play 45,000 roles at one single time if he wants to. He doesn't have to be 45,000 different people to do it. Good heavens have mercy. Even as an actor can perform two roles in a play or a television program, the only difference being that God, being God, can perform multiple roles at any given time without being different persons or personages. No, God is able to appear in heaven as the Father and on earth as the Son, all the while being one singular God. We human beings cannot do this. But then, we're not God. In doing this, God himself was able to appear in the sight of men as the physical offspring of the Almighty. He was understood to be divine, yet he was also seen as a legitimate, literal, physical human being. The Spirit of God the Father could communicate with the physical man, Jesus, internally. Same way the Holy Ghost speaks to us sometimes internally. Or externally. The same way God spoke to prophets. The same way God spoke to Moses. The same way God is able to speak to us today. Doesn't mean... It's separate people. 
No, he can communicate internally. He can communicate externally. He can speak to the son externally and say, when the son says, glorify thy name, and he says, I have done it and I'll do it again externally. But it doesn't make them two different people. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Is this helping you today? Is this helping you understand today a little bit? I'm going to go a few minutes extra, but not too long. I'm, I'm doing fairly well. He was understood to be divine, yet he was also seen as a human being. The Spirit of God could communicate internally or externally. When he spoke to the flesh externally, he did so as a sign to nearby human observers. This provided proof to those who heard that this man Jesus did indeed have a unique relationship as the Son with the invisible, almighty, omnipresent God of Israel. Hallelujah. In John 12, 28 through 30, Jesus spoke and said, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Listen, listen, listen. Oh, I wish people would just let the word of God say what the word of God says. The very next verse then says, The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, listen, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Hallelujah. I don't need the Spirit to speak to me externally. The Spirit's within me. If God were a separate person and needed to communicate to me, he don't have to speak aloud. No, but this manifestation, it was done this way for my benefit. No, for yours. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The day will come when all the world will glorify God our Father in making the declaration that Jesus is Lord. His divinity will be clearly seen and fully recognized by every living being that has ever walked planet Earth. But until then, the saints of God are made aware of this truth by revelation in the here and now. My Lord, have mercy. Philippians 2, 8 through 12, and being found in fashion as a man. You remember, this is a continuation of what we read earlier. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Oh my God, every angel is going to bow. Every human is going to bow. Every demon is going to bow. Hallelujah. At the name of Jesus. And things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <laughs> it will glorify God the Father 
when humanity finally falls to its knees and declares Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy. Sweet, sweet, sweet Jesus. Hallelujah. Revelation 21, 2 through 7, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Anybody who knows anything at all about the word of God knows Jesus Christ is declared to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Just look at Revelation 1, 7 and 8. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Who are we talking about? Jesus. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. Oh my God, which is and which was and which is to come. Listen to me, Jehovah's Witness. The Almighty. Hallelujah to God. You get these theological twits who want to bicker over words. Oh, the Old Testament prophet said Jesus is the mighty God. Jehovah is the Almighty. <laughs> Read your Bible. Not the one you rewrote to say what you want it to say. Read a legitimate Bible. Jesus declares, I am Alpha and Omega. Who else is said to be Alpha and Omega? The Lord. Who is the Lord? God is the Lord. Hallelujah. He said, He which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Hallelujah. Lastly, today in closing, 1 Corinthians 8, 5 and 6. The Apostle Paul writes, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, and there be gods many, and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. The same one we call Lord is the same one the word of God tells us is called God. And one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ not was, not will be, 
is Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy. I want to tell you, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God had a plan. He had a design from the beginning, and he spoke that plan. That plan was with him from the beginning, and honey, that plan included him from the beginning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And he designed the man Jesus to be that perfect balance to somehow navigate the most difficult, treacherous of waters so that enough of his divinity might shine through to identify him as Messiah. The Old Testament prophet said, Behold, your God cometh. He will save you. Oh, and when he comes, he said, the blind eyes will be open and deaf ears will be unstopped and the lame man shall leap as a harp, uh, as a heart. And then we read in the New Testament, John the Baptist is facing his end. He wants to make certain he has done his job and he's performed his calling. He sends some of his disciples to the Lord Jesus and said, John just wants to make absolutely certain that you are who he proclaimed you to be. And Jesus didn't say, go back and tell him, yes, he was right. What did he say? He said, go back and tell him what you've seen. Blind eyes have been opened. <laughs> Deaf ears have been unstopped. The lame have leaped as an heart. Hallelujah to God. These are things the Old Testament prophets said would happen who? When God showed up as Messiah. When God showed up to be the Savior. He said, go back and tell them what you've seen. Oh, hallelujah. God knew what he was doing. When he designed the man Jesus, the man Jesus, who would be the revelation and manifestation of himself. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name.